Okay, so let's get your leash, okay? Okay, there we go. He's always had a great sense of humor, always had the ability to make me laugh. You know, ALS keeps your mind intact, and if you um, don't allow it to beat you down, you can still have that spirit. And that's what I see in John. I mean, he just has an incredible um, positive spirit and attitude and outlook on life. Because I ask him all the time, you know, how's your mood? And what do you say to me? <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> you're, you're amazing. <laughs> you still look young. We met in France. John was a Stanford undergrad, and and I was a Mills student. A friend introduced us. And we went on a hitchhiking trip, and I really didn't know John that much. He was a kind of quiet guy, and he thought I was like this airhead Asian gal who laughed too much, and <laughs> not really his type, perhaps. But we we uh, we became good buddies. Uh, we hitchhiked and um, actually kind of fell in love on that trip. I found Karen to be a fascinating. Person with a heart of gold. I really thought we were meant for each other. Having three daughters, two of whom were twins, and Nikki, the oldest, uh, was only two years older than them. So we had Nikki and then Natalie and Allison. All of a sudden, we had three kids in diapers at the same time. <laughs> And John was just a marvelous father and a marvelous husband and, and partner. The first indication was around April of 2013. Something was off with my speaking. What he told me was happening, and I could tell from his voice, he said that, you know, uh, he thought it was lingering effects from a bad cold that he had had. He was slurring and, and not being able to enunciate as he'd like to. So we went to a number of different doctors. And it took about, you know, 14 months before we finally did uh, go to a neurologist. We'll be in this room right here. I'll check your blood pressure on your left arm. They sent us to Stanford um, to a neuromuscular neurologist. And, you know, she did further testing and sat us down and said, you know, has anyone talked to you about ALS? And it was like, huh, what? And I was just like stunned. And I think John too. And we kind of looked at each other and I said, you know, well, how sure are you of this? And she said, about 70%. So we've discussed this before, the medication isn't necessarily going to make you stronger. Uh, the hope is that it slows the progression of the disease. So if you were on a decline like this, then you would start to decline like this. So it would sort of slow the progression. At that point, I mean, I'm looking at John and I'm trying to say, you know, don't fall to pieces. Don't start, you know, crying and sobbing, you know, because John will think that there's no hope and you know, there's 30% chance that this diagnosis isn't right. And we talked about it some more. And then that's when we just sat together, you know, holding hands and crying. It was just, it was just really a very devastating diagnosis. You know, how are we going to manage this? What's, what's going to happen? What is life going to be like?
And I imagine for John, it might have been even more frightening. I mean, no. I just. It's easier for me, much easier than for you. Your right hand is stronger than the left one. Right. Oh. So the way how we take it, we take off the, the good one first. My joke about it was is surrender your pride and dignity. After that, it's pretty easy. I actually worry more about my women in the family than me. They think it's much harder. One of the hardest things is just um, the everydayness of it. I'm a very creative person and I like to have a lot of change in my life and do different things and um, and yeah, it can wear you down a little bit. Sometimes on the weekend, uh, we don't always have caregiver coverage and it makes for a really long day when you do everything yourself. There are only so many hours in the day and there's endless amounts of things that you could do. It's just a lot of stuff that has to do with hygiene. You know, every time you do a therapy, there are all these hoses and masks and whatever, and you're just washing our supply cabinet. I mean, it's just chock full. There's just so much stuff. <laughs> People, I think, don't I, have any idea. I am high maintenance. <laughs> you're high maintenance, but you're worth it. <laughs> yeah, so we don't need another sharps container. We have one. Um, alcohol pad. We're fine with alcohol pads. Um, yeah, he was at the ALS clinic. Um, so he says that he has less breath and his legs are weak. The, the other thing is just mental health. You know, sometimes you think that everything's just fine and then something will happen, there'll be a setback, and you just, it, there's just a tremendous emotional drain. And when that happens, you just don't feel capable of doing normal stuff. Being able to do my regular job and do all the other things that's required of people, sometimes it's just really hard. It's okay to cut yourself some slack if you're a caregiver and things are happening to your loved one and you know just trying to cope with all of that. ALS is a terminal illness, we all know that. And unfortunately, ALS uh, patients don't live that long. I think three to five years after diagnosis is the, is the average. You know, it can get kind of distressing. So I don't want to put any time on it, you know, because then you're just counting the days till someone's going to be gone and that's, no, that's not what living is all about. Let's live each day and let's not you know, we're not living to die, we're living to live. He brought his voice and everything, that's right. Are you ticklish? Are you ticklish? Are you ticklish? Yes, you are, my princess. Oh, he's so cute. Oh, he's so cute. Oh, he's smiling. There's all these milestones that John has been able to look forward to. Since he was diagnosed, our oldest got married. Uh, she just had a grandchild in, um, our, our first grandchild in December. Uh, also in December, um, one of our twins, Allison, uh, got married. And then in April, um, the second twin, um, Natalie, got married. So we have three weddings and a grandson. It sounds like a, a movie, right? Get very good today. Like my mom and dad, like Karen and John, like Francis and Charles, we are witnessing, we are celebrating a love story. I have a 
would like to invite Natty and Paul to share their vows. I love that you are incredibly intelligent and thoughtful. I love that you love your family, and I love that you make me feel loved all the time. I love what a caring and kind person you are. I love that you put others in love as well. I love you, and there's no one else in the world I'd rather have by my side than good and bad. Natalie Ferriolo and Paul Manning, by the power vested in me in the state of California, I am pleased to pronounce you wife and husband. Go for it. <laughs> It was just a very meaningful event. It was a, it was a beautiful event. And I'm so glad that um, John was able to participate in that. You know, we've been able to do a lot of things that we might not have done, seen a lot of people and family, people that mean a lot to us. So many people have reached out. We have visitors all the time. We're very, very lucky that way. Because I have a lot. I don't have the work anymore. So I have much less stress. <laughs> and I can focus on uh, experiencing love with family and Friends, <laughs> life is quite amazing if you take the time to pay attention. You know, he has a pretty terrible disease and for the most part he faces it with um, courage and dignity. And so I want people to know that you can live in the moment with someone that you love who has ALS and, um, and find great joy in that. That, um, you know, just because someone has a disability or is not the same person in terms of their capabilities, they really are the same person inside. And hopefully uh, that's the person that you fell in love with. Uh, that person is still there. I mean, even if their voice changes and they can't walk anymore or they can't hug you anymore, they're, they're still that person and, um, and they still love you the same. I look at it that we all have blessings and burdens. Even people who are healthy have burdens. I've got problems. You've got problems. Everyone has problems. And well, I, I got another problem with ALS, but I'm not different than anyone else. The fact that he wakes up with a smile and goes to sleep with a smile and, and is really genuine. I don't think he's trying to hide anything. I think that's just the way he is. And I think it's because he has peace and that he's accepted whatever happens is going to happen. I don't stress about the future, whatever comes, will come. And I have nobody lives forever anyway. Life is a terminal illness. You know, we have one life, all of us have one life to live on earth and we should make the most of it and we shouldn't spend it all worrying about the future when we have today to enjoy. <laughs>